at this point, if this is working, um, you've actually done something very complex that would have taken probably at least two, maybe three weeks in a regular length um, JavaScript class. We've introduced a lot of concepts very fast about objects and defining functions and event listeners. When I usually teach my CIS 165 class, it's 16 weeks long, and we don't get to this that you did until like three or four weeks in, into like the fourth assignment. So we are looking at something very accelerated, but just to show you the basic concepts that this is the interactive language. All of the details of how it works, we won't have time to cover, but in the, um, in the Canvas class, we've got various readings that will be very helpful. I've glossed over a lot, you know, here's the what is it, what's a variable, what are strings and functions. And I've got various links there, and we're going to talk about forms at the moment. And um, this will be part of the assignment. The assignment will be that there's going to be a contact form. You're going to take what you previously worked on, on HTML lesson plus CSS lesson. Now we're going to add to it. In that, you had this sort of like autobiographical thing, right? Within a little bit of colors and design. We're going to then add a brand new contact form, a very simple, what's your name, what's your email, what's your message? Well, I want to capture that and then display it on screen. So similar to what we've done so far, but we're going to learn, well, how do I capture something? How do I have boxes and then capture that and do something with it? So what we're going to do together right now will be very close to what you're going to need to do for the actual homework. And if you get this working, then you transfer your code over to the right place and maybe change a couple of names and such, it, it should work. So that's our goal here. We're going to continue this by creating a basic form to ask for two things, um, and then capture that and do something with it. So getting back to our code, the form is still part of the HTML world. It's still part of the structure. The form is going to be boxes where people can type stuff, and then a send button. So HTML can create the form, and CSS can make the form look nice, but then JavaScript makes the form do something. Let's back up over here. We've got this button that just says click me. Okay, let's, uh, let's create, after the button, let's create a horizontal rule. Let's just create a line, a dividing line. And um, next we'll create a form. So for our comment, we can say in HTML form with three inputs. So we're about to create a form. We have the tag. We have the HTML element. We have the pair form. I'm going to ask for the person's um, uh, name. I'm going to ask for their email, and then their message, and then send. So in the form, we'll create a label that'll say name, and another label that will say uh, message. So on screen, the form will ask for your name and message. And then we'll create two boxes, which is an input. Each of these will be an input. So on one line, I'm going to ask for the person's name. And it will then have an input. And on the next line, I'll ask for the message. Now, inputs do not have a pair, so you don't put open input, close input, it's just input. Label has a pair. We're marking our text label explaining this input starts here, and then our text label explaining this input ends here. This, this input right here is for name, and this input here is for their message. 
and we've got another label that says write your message. So if I save and run that, I have what I've had before, my H1, I've got the button, and then I've got a line, and then I've got name and a box, and message and a box. And in those boxes, I can start typing stuff. I actually, however, want, kind of like I designed it here, I want the name on one line and the, and the message on the next line. But here, when it renders, they're on the same line. Does anyone remember in HTML, how do I break a line so that it goes to the next line? BR, yeah. BR. So one of the ways is BR. I'm going to add a break at the end of this line to say, show the name and the input, break it, then show the message and then that input. And that result then is they go on separate lines. And right here then it torments me that these are not lining up perfectly. I want those lined up perfectly. If only there was a way to style the design of my form. CSS, of course. But we're not going to worry about that. You're not going to worry about uh, styling this perfectly. Um, but I get my result right there. And actually, technically, if you put a space here, these things won't be bumping up to each other so much. There'll be a little space. Again, don't worry that it doesn't line up properly. That's what CSS is all about. But anyway, we've got name, we've got input, we've got message, we've got input. When we... Um, when we then, uh, when you usually, when you fill out a form, you usually have a way to then process it. You have some send button, go button, save button, some sort of button that then, you know, starts processing it. So let's break that line to the next line and we'll put input. But, um, default of input is it creates an input box. Okay, no problem. We actually have different input type attributes. Submit. The default input HTML element is a box for you to input um, content. If I then change the type by adding the attribute to type, and we've got a bunch of types, one of them is submit. And what that does is it turns your simple input box into a button. It says submit. But if I wanted to say something else, I might have a value property to say like save, or go, or send, or whatever I want. So in this case, the simple input gets upgraded by saying what type of input is it, and what type of value does it have for text. These are both attributes of the input element. And if I try typing something here and I click Save, nothing really happens. It kind of seems like the screen resets. It doesn't actually send it anywhere. We haven't fully programmed that yet. That's where JavaScript kicks in. HTML is just concerned with making our form, and then JavaScript is conf uh, concerned with making it do something. But oftentimes, when you're writing some sort of filling stuff in a form and you want to start over, what kind of other button might there be? A reset button, or a start over, or a cancel. So we've got another one. Let's add a new one at the end here. Input, but of type reset, and then a value of whatever you wanted to say, cancel maybe, or clear, you might see that. So now we've got a button that it clears your form, a button that saves or sends, I want that to say send, or maybe you can make it say go, whatever you want. Go doesn't do anything yet, that's when JavaScript will kick in. Uh, there's our form so far. It's not quite done yet, but does that work? Are you seeing those input boxes? Are you seeing the buttons? 
Anyone need help? This is the form so far. We've got these labels that appear on screen. We've got these inputs. We didn't specify any extra attributes, and it worked fine. We need to specify a couple more. We'll do that. We've got these inputs. So similar to creating the button, the button was super simple in that there's some HTML thing that exists, and we gave it an ID so that JavaScript knows it exists. We're going to do something similar to this. We're going to need some IDs so that JavaScript knows that this form exists and that those fields exist, so we can then capture what's written in them and do something. And the something will just be a little pop-up that says, this is what you wrote. We're not going to get complex at all. Um, in the grand scheme of it. But again, this is something that in, in the regular JavaScript class, this might be like an assignment, you know, four or five weeks into the class. But we're going to learn just enough to get a sense of this is what JavaScript is, so it's not totally alien for the assignment. Let's back up to the form and give it an ID attribute. We'll call this fm for form. Um, we'll call it user input. This is the example where we invent an ID attribute. We give it a unique name. I might have more than one form, so that the JavaScript knows which form am I talking about. I've got a unique ID, which we can call whatever we want. This is another example. I can call this kitty cat. And as long as I reuse my code that I invented, it should work. OK, so the form has a unique ID. We're going to do something similar to those inputs, but before that, this label needs an attribute of for, F-O-R. This label will be used for this input. This label will be used for this input. This text is related to this box. That's what for is about. I'm going to use this label for this input. Just because it's on the same line doesn't mean there's any relationship or meaning. This is giving it meaning. And I'll call it in name. This is an input that this is an input that is used being used for something with a name of in name. This input. This has a name of in name. Okay, now we've connected it. We've got some text that is related to some input. The way we do that is by saying this label is going to be used for something with this name. This is the something with this name, literally. And then lastly, for the JavaScript to know, for the JavaScript to be able to read what's inside of this box, we give it an ID, and I'll call it the same thing, in name. Yes, it's the same value of the attribute three times, but it is three different attributes. They all have a purpose. The for and the name go together to link the, the text in the box, and then the ID goes with the JavaScript when we write the JavaScript so they can detect what's inside of the box. I need to do the exact same thing for message and the input there. Using the same sort of uh, idea, I'm going to have in message for the label, and then in message for the name of the input, and then an ID in message. For in message, I'll go MSG. I don't want to type out the whole the whole thing. It takes too long. And then name in message, and then the ID in message. So all of those should match. Same spelling, capitalization. And now this text is linked to or related to this input box.
if I see my result in the browser, nothing really changed visually. This is just all behind the scenes. Clear should still clear things, and then Go doesn't really do much yet. Ultimately, I'm going to press Go, and then um, a pop-up will happen, and it'll just say, your name is whatever, and your message is whatever. So I'm still setting up my form. But if you get this working to get today together in class with us, it's going to be very close what you're going to need to do for the assignment. So again, if you looked at the assignment requirements and it looked so advanced and, and, and alien and I don't know what I'm doing, if you're able to get our code working in class, you should be very close to getting it to work for the assignment. Okay, so is that working so far? It still looks the same as before. Nothing weird happened. And if you press F12, you should be no error messages. Okay, no errors. Good. If an error happens in the console, we need to fix that. And remember, it tells you at the end, check your line 37 or 12 or whatever. If there is some sort of big, red, scary error message, check the line number there and see if you misspelled something. It's very common that you misspell capital letter versus lowercase, or you put a dot instead of a period. When is it, when is it a dot? When is, when is it a period? Again, when you take the longer class and you practice and you learn it more, you know when is when, but it's a little too early to go into a lot of detail on that. Okay, so just like the button this is this whole thing is kind of just like the button this simple button here we have content and an id this whole thing is has content plus some more than one id but then it's going to be the whole concept itself again we create constants we create our own objects based on the things that exist there we then create an event listener on the event of the person clicking submit do something we create then our own function and our function will be a pop-up, or play a sound, or change the color to red, or do something. So let's go back to our JavaScript area. And we will say, create the object, aka constant, for the form. Create the event listener to wait for a click on submit and then create a function aka object to do some commands afterwards after clicking the submit button do stuff like make a pop-up, play a sound, change the background color. None of that will happen until you click Submit. None of that, like detecting what's in those boxes, what did they type into those boxes, none of that will happen until they click Submit. So we need to set ourselves up here to pay attention to the form, pay attention to the click, and then do the steps. That's the idea that I'm trying to do here. So I wrote it as a comment. Then I have to write these specific commands of JavaScript. A lot about what programming, learning a programming language is, is how do I take a human concept that I can explain in human words and translate it into the machine language of the particular programming language? Because in one language, you might use C-O-N-S-T, constant. On another language, you might use V-A-R, variable. On another language, you might use I don't know, whatever, but every language might be slightly different, but all of them do very basic uh, similarities. So C-O-N-S-T, let's create a new constant. We will call this L-F-M um, user input equal to, oops, sorry about that, not this equal here. There we go, there we go. See so yeah, how the color was a little off. Constant space, whatever we want to call this. This 
you might say, well, why don't I just call it exactly the same as what I have it up here? Up here, it's called FM user input. You could call it there, but calling it the exact same thing in two different places could be confusing. Am I referring to the version in HTML or the version in JavaScript? So I usually add EL at the beginning to show this JavaScript object is based on an element of HTML. And in the HTML, I have a lowercase f, and that'll work just fine too. We're inventing it at the moment, so call it what you want. But it's very common that when there's the names of these things that you invent, usually the second or more word is capital. It can all be lowercase if you want. You just have to keep it the same. Same as before, document. dot get element by ID parentheses semicolon we're dealing with a more complex form but the idea is exactly the same with the simple button let's create a constant about a button let's go find the button based on its ID let's create a constant representing the form let's go find the form by its ID what goes inside of the parentheses what's the ID of the form FM user input. FM user input is the is the ID that we gave the form. Okay, so all of this sets up the first of these. Create an object representing the form. Next, create an event listener to wait for a click on submit. Similar to what I did above on line 42, we have the name of the object that we just created. Get, or not get, um, L, FM, user input dot add event listener. the same there. What's different is what object am I using the method on? There's a command and I'm using it on that object. I invented that object up here. Here. This is the event listener, the command, listen for something, wait for something based on this object. This object was made right here and this object is based on a thing in the HTML with that ID. That's the logic there. Parentheses. I had once you clicked on that object, run a function. This will be slightly different because we're dealing with a form and a form has a specific event. Submit. When it detects the submit button, even though we called it go, ultimately up here there is a input type of submit. We called it, it says go. It can say anything. But this is a this is a submit. When it detects that the submit has been pressed on this form, this form is made from finding the thing with an ID. Once we detect submit, comma, run a function. Up here, we ran a function called click me, then we said what does click me mean? We defined it next. So here we'll make up a function called fn, short for function, user input. Similar to the basic button, we then said next line, we are trying to invoke, we're trying to call, we're trying to use a function, a command that we invented. Let's define what does that mean right here. Function of that invention is the following result. So next line, I use the function keyword, and then fn user input, parentheses, curly braces,
This is exactly as before up here in terms of we're defining a function, it'll then be clicked and it'll do something. We'll, we'll first make it do the, the pop-up. We'll make it have a window pop-up um, just like before just to confirm is this working and then if we confirm that it's working so far then what we have to do is actually read what did they type into this input? What did they type into this input? So we will do the same thing here, window.alert, semicolon there, quotes, it works. Okay, save it and run it. Um, this is very similar to what we did up there, but with a couple changes of specific objects. But the big ideas are still the same. Let me confirm mine works first. Uh, you don't have to type anything into those boxes yet, but if I click Go, I do get a pop-up. It works. Every time I click it, it says it works. The first button still is there, clicked. The second button should pop up with it works. It doesn't matter if you type anything in these yet. It's not reading what's in there yet. But this is what it should do so far. I get the pop up that says it works. Let's pause there. We did a lot of writing. But this is 99% the same as this. It's just that the particular object names are changed or IDs and such. Let's pause there. Did anyone need a uh, yeah, question? Everything else is working for me except the pop ups. When I type it, it's on the um, visual for those two. Okay, so those pop ups so far have not worked. Let's see if there's a
I'll show you what's highlighted here. For some reason, did you save in the test? Because it looks like you're just missing the data. You don't have the data here. Why don't you close it? All right, so if this worked, let's do a little bit more. This is at the moment able to detect that when you press the button in the form, it, um, it does something. It makes a simple pop-up, but I just don't want it to say it works. I want it to read what was in those boxes and make that appear on screen instead of it works. Now at the moment, if you, if, if you look at this technically, 
if I don't fill in any of these things and I click go, it wants to do something. But don't you usually have to fill stuff in before it lets you go? Isn't there usually the requirement of filling things in? So we can add an attribute um, to say, make sure that the person typed in something into the name and the message before allowing it to go. So we'll back up into the HTML. Um, this input so far, name and message, they're not really caring if they get filled in or not. So we'll add a new attribute. Input, and it has a name and an ID, we're going to add a new attribute. I'm going to add it before name required equals true. I'm adding it before name and ID, and the order of your code does matter usually, but in this case, not, not really technically. But I personally like to leave the name and the ID as the last attributes because I often have to go back to refer to them. And if I leave them at the very end, when I go back and scan through my code, what did I call that thing? Oh, there's the last thing I can find it easily. I could have added required after everything that's already there, and it would have worked fine. In this case, it doesn't matter the order. But again, I personally, when I, when I do this in real life or teach this, I like to leave name or ID as the last ones because you can find that easier. You don't have to refer to required very often, but I have to refer to ID or name all the time. And leaving it at the end lets me find it faster. So now I'm saying the name is required. What do you think you do for making the message required? Same thing. So let's go to the input of the message and also required equals true. Now when you try to submit the form without filling anything in, it should give you a pop-up, please fill out this field. So everything else is the same, but now with the, these two required attributes, it, it automatically then does a little bit of um, conf confirmation, error checking that you didn't fill this out. And so if I do fill in the first one with whatever, and then try to go. Still says that one's got to be filled in. Then when I fill out the next one, they both got filled in. It works. Okay, so that was that was back on the HTML in the old days when you were creating this. Uh, you had to have JavaScript also do the checking. Uh, before it would proceed and now in more modern times you just add that attribute required true and by itself the browser knows let's check it is it empty or not so we don't have to write it used to be like really like a dozen more lines of JavaScript just to confirm is it empty or not and now we just have required is true and that's it what we still have to write is let's look at what was typed into the input. Let's get the values or the data that was inside of input and do something with it. So back to our function over here, the one that says it works. And usually a function will have many sub commands. Right now we just have one command, alert, just like up here. But usually a function that we invent will have more than one command. So we actually should back up to where we have that uh, that window. Let me just zoom in here to see it, and press Enter to break it to the next line, and then the curly brace break that to the next line. This is much more common that we're saying. Let's create a function. Let's create a series of steps. This is the name of it. We start the series of steps, the code block. Next line, all of our one to one hundred lines of code, whatever, and then the end of our function. This is equivalent to this being on one line. But we usually want this because we have more than one set of commands. And because we're going to lose track of this curly brace all by itself there, what I usually do when I teach this is to then write a comment here that says end of fn user input. Because when you're looking through 100 lines of code, 1,000 lines of code, and if you start at the bottom especially and you're scrolling up, 
And you see this all by itself right here. Where does this even connect to? What does it belong to? Yeah, the code editor oftentimes, if you click on it, it does highlight where it starts. And it's just right there, two lines away. But again, if I had a bunch of lines of code like this, don't write this, of course. But if I have it like this and I click here, I might have a hard time. Where does that start? Well, because I made the note, this is the end of my user input function. I should be able to pay better attention to it. OK, so let's actually do something before the pop-up. The code runs in order. I don't want the pop-up to happen before I've checked what's in the box in those inputs. If I make the pop-up and say, show me what's in the name box, and then I say, check what's in the name box, you get an error because it runs in sequence. We will first say, check what's in the name box, and then pop up to show that. So we will say, comment, check what's in the name input, and store it temporarily in memory. JavaScript is very powerful in that it can read what's inside of a box of HTML and then process it somehow. The default is that all of the all of this stuff in in memory is temporary unless you save it to a file or a database. This is just floating around in the memory. It's temporary. That's the default. So we're going to check what's in the um, in, in those boxes. Uh, we use we do that by uh, creating an object. I'm going to create an object that will temporarily store what's um, in the uh, in the input field. We use the keyword first of all let sort of like let me remember this. Let me remember what's in the box. And here we make this up. So we will say um, val in name equal to. Let is a way for us to keep track of data. Let me remember this in the computer's memory. And this object has whatever name we invent, kind of like constant up there. And we set it to what's inside of that input field. We have to find that input field. In the document, we will get an element by its ID. Get element by ID. That input field, the name input field, has an ID in name. dot value so if you kind of read it from right to left we get another understanding let's check the value let's check the data that's inside of an input field an input field named in name which is an ID of an element in the document store it in a variable in an object that we created let us store it in a variable, in an object. So that's another way to read what that, what we did there. We're checking what's in the name input and storing it temporarily in memory. So instead of it saying it works, I want it to say what the name was that we typed into the box, the value of the name in the box. All of this is to get the value in that box and store it here. So in the window, we will make a pop-up that will say what's in this object, val in name. Now, that's going to be val in name. And if you know what we're doing here, you might say, wait, just wait. Let's try this. So now we're getting a little more complex. We're saying 
let's read what's in that input box let's store it temporarily and next line let's display what we put into that object go ahead and save it and run it and see what happens you have to fill in those boxes You have to fill in those boxes because we've added the required attribute. I'm going to put my name, a message, click, hell, uh, click go, and then we get a pop-up, just like I expect, but then what popped up was not what I expected on purpose. Because I filled in my name, I filled in a message, I click go. All of that works as before. The new part right here. Let's look at the value. What did they type into that box? And then display in a box what's in that. Okay, I'm getting the pop-up. And it just says value and name. Because right here, in previously when we wrote quotes, there was a string. And when you go through the readings, it'll explain in detail what's a string. And it literally said the name of the object instead of what's in the object. So that object that we created on line 54, val in name, it's like, it's like a container. It's a box. This is one of these variables. This thing could be holding um, you know, books or um, pens or whatever. This object can hold stuff. But this object can be defined, but what's the name of the object? A box. Or what's inside of it? If I put in quotes the name of the object, it'll show me the name of the object. I don't want to see what the name of the object is, I want to see what's in the object. Take away the quotes, both of them, and try again. Quotes is a string, and when you go through the readings you'll understand it more completely. But take away the quotes and try it again. take away the quotes now it does what I want I don't want to know what the name of the object is and this says pocket constitution quantity 100 I don't want that I want to know what's in the box I want to display what's in the box so no quotes that would be very important to write a comment about note when you use quotes you will literally write the string or name of the thing, object, with no quotes, you, um, you will write or show the value inside of the object. use quotes you will literally show the string name of the object with no quotes you will show the value inside the object so one thing has one purpose and one thing has another purpose it, it wasn't we wrote it all properly we got the wrong result because it was an error in logic. I didn't want to show that I have a box. I wanted to show that I've got stuff in a box. So those quotes are um, very important. In some cases, I wanted to literally say the message, hello world. But in this case, I didn't want it to say something literal. I wanted to sh say it, I wanted to show what was inside of the value, uh, the object. So when that pops up right here, I get the value inside of the box, great. But I don't just want it to say my name, I want it to say something else like, 
your name is, and then every time dynamically, whatever the person types will change. So in this alert, it'll, it'll write into the pop-up exactly what we tell it in there. So I wanted to also say, your name is, and then what's inside of the variable, what's inside of the object. So here we'll write quotes, your name is plus, so now the pop-up will say the message literally here, your name is, this will never change, it's in quotes, and then plus sign, and then displays what's inside this object. This object has some value. Every time we click go, it'll check it again. Every time we press the button, it triggers. There's the event listener. Every time it triggers, it checks it. Every time we press go. So every time you type a new name in the box, it'll check a new value and say the message. It'll always say, your name is. But then what's in that variable changes. Now try that. So if I type my name, my message, it's not paying attention to the message yet. And I click go, it pops up. Your name is whatever you wrote. If, you, if, you, uh, if your name is right next to the colon, if there's no space, well, you also need to write a space right here. I wrote a space. I didn't tell you, just to see if you noticed. But if I don't put a space there, it'll do exactly what I told it. It'll say, your name is... And then right next to it will be your name. If I want a space between the colon and the name, I need to put a space there. This is an example that proves that computers are dumb. Because of course I want space between things, logically. But unless I actually program that empty space, and the thing about spaces in a programming language is space is not nothing. It's still one byte of data. A space is actually internally ASCII character number 32. There's a whole list of all of the letters, including spaces. So even spaces take up data, one byte of data. And one byte doesn't sound like a lot, because you know nowadays we watch uh, videos that are like gigabytes long. A gigabyte is a billion bytes. A megabyte is a million bytes. So imagine one billion of those little spaces equals one gigabyte. And that's like, if you have your flash drive, how big is your flash drive? 8 gigabytes, 16, 32, whatever. So that 32 gigabyte flash drive can be filled with 32 billion empty spaces. It's pretty interesting. OK, window alert is saying a message plus that. Uh, we asked for two things, their, their name and their message. Based on what we've done so far, we have the knowledge to capture the name and display it. Based on what we have so far, we should be able to capture the message and display it. So right here, we said let. Let's create a variable. Let's create an object. Let's create another one. Next line let val in message equal to document dot get element by id quotes in message dot value okay so that's 99% the same from a moment ago. What has changed is, what is the new object called that I'm inventing? You cannot use the same object name over and over. It'll get confused. Here's an object to hold their name, an object to hold their message. It's all the same. Look for something with an ID. If that other box has a different ID, every, ID, every object up on the HTML area, every HTML element should have its own unique ID if you're going to do something with it. So it has its own unique ID, and we're still getting the value. And we're assigning it to, we're setting it, we're putting it into this object. So over here now, if we want to display it, we have two ways to do it. Well, at least two ways. One is we just make another window alert. Your message is, 
but that'll make two pop-ups. Do I really want two separate pop-ups? Or do I want to put both of that data in one pop-up? Let's take a quick vote right here. We have those two options. Make two pop-ups or use one pop-up. Raise your hand if you want to make two pop-ups. No one? OK. Raise your hand if you want to make one pop-up. Everyone? OK. Let's do two pop-ups, just like we asked for. <laughs> no, let's do one pop-up. Two pop-ups, obviously, is just another window alert. Your message is Val in message. To have it in the same pop-up, you just keep adding to it, space plus, quotes, your message is, space plus, space, val in message. That's how we add to the same pop-up. Do we want to make it look fancy or break it to a new line and all of that? That might be CSS. But here we're just adding more. The plus in this case works differently than 1 plus 1 is 2. In JavaScript, 1 plus 1 might equal 11. And we're not going to mention why yet. But here I'm saying make this text, static text, and then show this object value, and then show more static text, and then show the value of the next object. Go ahead and save and run that. Fill in both boxes. Click Go, and see how your pop-up appears with both items. Let's see that. So I'm going to save it and run it, confirm that it works how I should think. I want to fill in something here. Click go. Your name is this, your message is this. Whoops, but here's the example about how computers are dumb. I at least didn't want that to be right next to each other. Maybe I wanted it to its onto the next line. Well, you never told it, so it didn't know what you wanted, and it did nothing. So to kind of clean it up a little bit, you could put backslash n space. Now that's a backslash. Regular old slash looks forward like that. That's the one that you always see with HTTP colon slash slash. That's a, that's a slash. If you ever say backslash, I'm coming to your house, because that's not a backslash. That's a backslash. It leans back. It's right next to the um, backspace. So that's basically saying, now let's create a new line, like break, kind of. Let's write this message, and then it's break. Why isn't it BR? Because that's, um, that's uh, HTML. This is JavaScript. And so it breaks to the next line, or new line. And now when I test it, Go, pop up. There it is. There. So there's the first line, next line. And every time that I click go after typing something in, and click go, it pops up with the new data. There's part of it that's static that never changes, and then there's part of it that is dynamic. Okay, so uh, let's take our second break. Um, there's a lot that could have gone wrong, of course, but it seems that a lot of people are on track, or if not, you get some help and you get back on track. So it's 3.11. Let's be back at 3.21, 10 minutes. We'll do a little bit more. I'm going to put a copy of my code into the folder in case you want to compare. We'll be back in 10 minutes. We'll do a little bit more.